thank you. And I would like to thank the organizers for asking me to speak to you on managing thyroid emergencies. I have no conflicts of interest to declare. So as an overview of what I'll be covering, um, I have two case vignettes uh, addressing two different sides of the spectrum, one on thyroid storm and one on myxedema coma. I will discuss the definition, epidemiology and presentation of these uh, cases, their diagnosis and management, as well as their longer term management and prognosis. So straight into the first case then, this is a 53 year old female patient who presents with acute confusion, abdominal pain and shortness of breath. She was diagnosed with Graves' disease three years earlier and has been non-compliant with her treatment. She also has asthma and is on a steroid and salbutamol in inhaler. On examination, she has a pulse of 152 beats per minute in atrial fibrillation and she is hypotensive. She has an increased respiratory rate and a high temperature. Saturations are 90% of on air and she's disorientated in place, time and person. Uh, listening to her chest, she has muffled heart sounds and bibasal crepitations, as well as a tender abdomen and a palpable liver edge. And you can see that she has a raised white cell count, a raised CRP and abnormal liver function. Uh, her ECG shows fast, shows fast atrial fibrillation and a cardiac echo shows an ejection fraction of 30%. Her thyroid function test indicates that she has an undetectable serum TSH, a raised 3T4 and a raised 3T3. And so my question to you is, what is the most appropriate management? Do you start high-dose propyl diuracil, high-dose carbimazole, amiodarone, diltiazem, or do you recommend that she has an emergency thyroidectomy? So I'll just give you a few seconds to think about these options, and I will come back to what I think is the right answer uh, at the end of this section. So thyroid storm, and that is what this patient has, was defined uh, initially in 1926 as a crisis of exophthalmic goiter. It is most common in patients um, with untreated or uncontrolled Graves' disease. And this really is a life-threatening condition, which is characterized by exaggerated signs and symptoms of thyrotoxicosis, as well as evidence of multi-organ decompensation. There usually is a precipitating event and that may be thyroid or non-thyroid related. And in up to 50% of patients, there is no identifiable trigger. The usual presentation of patients is with an altered mental state like this patient had, hyperparexia and cardiac dysfunction. So looking at the epidemiology, the incidence of this is 0 0.2 to 0 0.76 per 100,000 persons per year. In hospitalized patients, however, this incidence is higher uh, and is reported between 4.8 to 5.6 per 100,000 and is present in about 16% of those patients who are hospitalized with thyrotoxicosis. So traditional uh, series indicate that the mortality is high up between eight and 30%, but then a more recent series from the United States indicates that with modern treatment, this is now actually much less. What you can see here is the mortality uh, per year in patients uh, who presented with uh, thyroid storm, and you can see the numbers here, and then how the mortality is actually really quite low. So usually there is a precipitant. We know that this occurs most commonly in women with an average age of, age of about 50 years, and that is unsurprising because usually there is underlying Graves' disease. But the most common causes are that patients uh, do have a history of hyperthyroidism, uh, and then this is usually set off by an infection um, and treatment non-adherence. And again, that was present in this patient here. Uh, she definitely had stopped her treatment. There are a number of other causes, such as emotional stress. It's seen in patients with preeclampsia uh, and in patients uh, during pregnancy. And then there's a long list here of more rare causes that set this condition off. So the presentation really can be quite varied, and that is because, as we all know, we have thyroid receptors in virtually every organ in our body. But systemic features are usually a bit of fever, and that is nearly universal, diaphoris, and weight loss. Um, and then the uh, further presentations very much depend on the system that you're looking at. And these uh, are also the various systems that are used in the scoring systems. And I will come back to this in my next slides. So usually patients are tachycardic and hypotensive, 
uh, maybe in atrial fibrillation as this patient was, um, there may be gastrointestinal changes. And again, this patient uh, had been complaining of abdominal pain. Uh, there was tremor, agitation, and restlessness. Uh, and there may be another number of features that point us towards this being a thyroid storm, such as the patient having a goiter, exophthalmos, or scar from previous thyroid surgery. And so the most commonly used classification system or scoring system to determine whether a patient has thyroid storm or not are the birch ratowski criteria. So these are taken here from the uh, American Thyroid Association guidelines and from this publication that was actually published quite a few years ago. But like I've already said, this usually surrounds uh, thermoregulatory dysfunction, uh, looks at the cardiovascular system, gastrointestinal system, the central nervous system, and whether a precipitant history is present or not. So uh, patients with a very high temperature do uh, get a worse score if patients go into atrial fibrillation or in congestive cardiac failure, such as uh, was the case in our patient, uh, as well as a number of these other uh, symptoms and, and signs here that will give a higher score. Um, and so generally, if you have a score that is uh, greater than 45, this is a thyroid storm. And if it's less than 25, then a storm is unlikely. If it's between 25 and 45, that we, this is called impending storm. This patient uh, scored very much over uh, 45 uh, on the scoring system. And then the Japanese Thyroid Association has made uh, their own uh, classification system. But again, this is based on very similar criteria to the birch ratowski criteria. Um, what this requires is that the patient has thyrotoxicosis with elevated levels of 3T3 and 3T4. And then again, this looks at central nervous system manifestations, the presence of a fever, tachycardia, congestive heart failure, and gastrointestinal dysfunction. Uh, and a definite thyroid storm relies on a combination of this thyrotoxicosis and then at least one of the central nervous system manifestations, plus the fever, tachycardia, um, and then hepatic or uh, cardiac uh, failure uh, dysfunction. So again, very similar to the other classification system using very similar criteria, but I think you get uh, the message here as to which systems generally are the most prominent uh, in uh, patients when they present. And of course, in a patient who presents very acutely unwell like this, the list of differential diagnoses really is quite wide. Uh, patients in uh, cardiac failure could, uh, can be pulmonary edema from a different cause, neuromuscular disease, a pheochromocytoma uh, crisis, serotonin syndrome, uh, and often this is mimicked uh, or seen as an acute psychosis or an acute psychiatric illness or septic shock. And again, these are uh, very important differential diagnoses to make when these patients present to us. So the mainstay of treatments uh, is uh, that you need to block new thyroid hormone synthesis and that you need to control uh, this patient. So the effects of the uh, high levels of thyroid hormones on peripheral tissues. And this is one situation where actually propyltyuracil is uh, the preferred treatment. As we all know, propyltyuracil usually is not used as a first-line treatment uh, in Graves' disease because it's had a lot of bad press, a bad liver failure. But a loading dose of propyltyuracil of 500 milligrams, uh, subsequently uh, giving 250 milligrams every four to six hours is usually the mainstay of treatment. And indeed, I gave this patient 500 milligrams and then she was put on 250 milligrams every six hours. And this blocks new, ho new thyroid hormone synthesis, but propyltyuracil has the advantage over metimazole that it will also block the conversion of T4 to T3. Uh, metimazole often can be given in combination with this um, and again will block new thyroid hormone synthesis and again this patient was put on both propyltyuracil and metimazole. Beta blockers are important as I said this patient had asthma so she was uh, in liaison with the cardiologist she was put on a different beta blocker but again a uh, beta blocker uh, was very important in order to uh, control this uh, patient's heart um, and indeed, she required invasive monitoring and, and um, uh, pump device. And again, I will come back to this. Saturated uh, potassium iodide solutions are very important in managing this. And usually you only start this one hour after you've started anti-thyroid drugs. And again, this will block new thyroid hormone synthesis as well as thyroid hormone release. And then these patients also need to be started on hydrocortisone. 
Um, usually uh, loading dose, uh, what, what I gave to this patient was a 200 milligrams uh, continuous uh, infusion or every 24 hours, but you can give this as a 300 milligrams intravenous load and then further uh, hydrocortisone every eight hours. And this is because these patients often we don't have a full history, so we don't know whether there may be relative adrenal insufficiency associated with it. And it is also a drug that helps in the blocking of T4 to T3 conversion. And then there are a number of supportive, so those are very thyroid specific treatments. There are a number of supportive treatments that we have to give. Uh, cholestyramine is very good at inhibiting the enterohepatic circulation of thyroid hormones. Um, and usually these patients have an infection, so they go on broad spectrum antibiotics, uh, cooling methods to control the hyperparexia, and then managing their congestive cardiac failure. Usually a patient who has a true thyroid storm will require an uh, admission to intensive care where they will need to be managed. And then we don't have this available in the UK now, but ioponoic acid, which is an oral, oral cholecystographic contrast, contrast agent, inhibits uh, D1 and D2 um, and has been used very successfully in this situation. But like I said, I certainly don't have that available in the United Kingdom. So there is uh, a literature with regards to therapeutic plasma exchange in these patients. And the principle here is that you will rapidly clear thyroid hormones, the excess thyroid hormones from the circulation. So the, uh, as we all know, thyroid hormones are bound to thyroxine binding globulin, and this will be removed from the circulation in plasma exchange. And then the colloid replacement that's given, which is usually albumin, will provide unsaturated binding sites for the circulating free thyroid hormones. So this has been used for uh, 50 years now in the management of thyroid storm with variable results. But the first uh, report of using this was in 1970. Uh, and what this table here uh, gives is an overview of uh, success of um, or use of plasma exchange. And you can see that uh, the 3T3 and 3T4 concentrations uh, are significantly changed uh, when you compare before and after uh, therapeutic plasma exchange. Um, there is no real consensus on using it uh, and often is seen as an adjunct to medical treatment. The effects are often transient and obviously this is a treatment that needs to be given uh, often on a daily basis uh, if you use that for this uh, indication, but can be used in conjunction with the other treatments I've already discussed. I think it's really important that you involve surgeons early in the management of these patients. So this is very much a multidisciplinary team approach. Uh, and I feel that surgeons need to be contacted within 12 to 24 hours following their admission. And indeed, that is what I did in this patient, because it may well be that they do not respond to any of the treatments that you give them, and that the only option you have is to do a thyroidectomy uh, in order to keep the patient alive. Um, so in those patients who deteriorate despite uh, full treatment or those who do not improve after 24 to 48 hours of intensive medical therapy, I feel that um, surgery may well be indicated. Um, patients who get severe side effects to antithyroid drugs, of course, we're going to be giving high doses of antithyroid drugs. As I've already explained in my lecture on hypothyroidism, uh, the side effects are very much those related. So these patients may get acranocytosis, thrombocytopenia, liver failure. And of course, uh, because they're often systemically very unwell, there may be other factors that are contributing to these findings. And again, it can be difficult to manage them with uh, antithyroid drugs. Uh, and then patients who have very severe underlying cardiac or pulmonary comorbidities. Uh, and if you do uh, surgery on these patients, then what is recommended is that you do a total thyroidectomy. So this patient actually put her on uh, ECMO. So again, that is, that is easy for me to recommend that this is something you do. You have to have that available in your center. I'm lucky to work in a center where this is available. And so very early on, because this patient was really uh, cardiovascularly very decompensated, she was put on ECMO uh, and that was the only thing that kept her alive really. Um, so, um, it's, uh, this represents temporary mechanical support for patients who have complete circulatory relapse 
And this allows time for restoration of uh, her euthyroid states and of, uh, of the patient's euthyroid state. And often uh, following this treatment, there is complete recovery of their left ventricular function. And again, here, just uh, because it's not widely used uh, and not widely available, but you can see here that with a varying duration of uh, ECMO administration, uh, I want to emphasize here that these are small numbers of cases. Of course, this is a rare condition, but uh, with ECMO uh, that's uh, being administered, uh, there is a very significant improvement uh, and survival in these patients. And you can see here uh, nearly 100% survival in patients where this was used. So what about the long-term management then? So um, the initial therapy uh, often needs to be weaned off slowly. Uh, it may be that you get a relatively good response, but remember that uh, circulating thyroxine has a very a long hard life, uh, very long half-life, um, and therefore weaning off the therapy uh, slowly is very important. Uh, usually these patients have been non-compliant. Um, it's unlikely that they will follow it, if they survive it, that they will subsequent to this be compliant and therefore early instigation of definitive treatment uh, often will uh, save them. Uh, and then adequate control of their thyrotoxicosis before you proceed with, with a definitive treatment is very important. So coming back to our case then, like I said, she required uh, ECMO treatment. Uh, she was uh, given treatment with antithyroid drugs, hydrocortisone, potassium iodide and beta blockers. Um, because of hyperperfusion, she had multiple impact, infarcts of her liver and bowel, so her liver function uh, became very abnormal. Uh, so after about a week of propyl thiuracil, I uh, weaned her off that uh, slowly because I was very worried about her liver. Um, her ejection fraction improved after one week of medical treatment. Uh, three months uh, following uh, this admission to intensive care, she had a total thyroidectomy and she remains well on levothyroxine. So I hope that you will all agree that following this presentation, the most appropriate treatment to start with on this patient, I feel, is high-dose propyl thiuracil. Um, so I hope I've convinced you that thyroid storm is a life-threatening emergency which has significant morbidity and mortality. Um, it is often associated with severe symptoms and signs of thyrotoxicosis. And what's important here is that this is multi-organ decompensation. There usually is a trigger, and that is usually infection. There are a number of standard scoring systems that can be used in order to identify if a patient has thyroid storm. But really importantly here, it does not matter how high your circulating thyroid hormone concentrations are. There is no lab value that confirms a diagnosis. And in fact, this patient had a relatively mild rise in 3T4 compared to some of the patients who quite happily walk into my clinic room or have significantly higher levels of 3T4. So the principles of treatment include that you inhibit new synthesis of thyroid hormones as well as their release and that you inhibit the peripheral effects of thyroid hormones uh, and uh, the enterohepatic circulation. Supportive measures are really important and often contribute to the survival of these patients, but very much this requires a multidisciplinary team approach with multiple experts on intensive care. Okay, moving to the other side of the spectrum then. Uh, this is uh, the second case vignette, and in this case, this is a 63-year-old, again, female patient who presents with acute confusion and drowsiness. She was recently diagnosed with cellulitis and had been started on fluoxacillin by her GP. She has a past medical history of bipolar disease, hypothyroidism and hypertension, and you can see she's on a long list of medications, including antipsychotic agents, but also levothyroxine and lisinopril. So she has a reduced TCS of 11 out of 15. She's bradycardic, hypotensive, with a low respiratory rate, and uh, is insufficiently oxygenating. She has cellulitis on her left leg, but no other specific signs on clinical examination. And whilst there's no focal neurology, she has low relaxation of the deep reflexes. And her laboratory results show that her serum TSH is greater than uh, our level of detection at greater than 90 million units per liter. Uh, her free T4 is low, as is her free T3. And she has a cortisol that is 449.7. So in principle, that is adequate on our assay. Although I would have thought that in a patient who is stressed uh, like this, the serum cortisol generally would be a little bit higher. 
So my question to you is, in, a port, in addition to supportive measures uh, and starting intravenous hydrocortisone, which treatment would you give to this patient? Do you give intravenous levothyroxine, high dose, intravenous liotharanine, high dose? Do you combine the two? Or do you give uh, levothyroxine via uh, nasogastric tube? She's, she's got GCS of 11, she's not gonna swallow. Or do you give a liotaranine via uh, NG tube? Uh, and these would be uh, more standard doses, 1.6 microgram per kilogram or 20 micrograms TDS. So again, I'll let, give you a few seconds to think about this. And again, I will come back to this once I've uh, presented my subsequent slides. Okay, so this patient has myxedema coma, and this is an endocrine emergency, which is decompensated hypothyroidism. So what you need here is a combination of an altered mental status, hypothermia, and depressed vital signs. And all these features were present in our patient. Whilst the name suggests it's a coma, coma is not always present and does not need to be present in order to make the diagnosis. Similar to thyroid storm, there usually is an inciting event, such as an infection. And often uh, this, this is not thought of when a patient presents in such, uh, with such a medical emergency and delays to diagnosis and management are common and they are what contribute to mortality. Uh, and even in modern series, this remains associated with significant morbidity and mortality. This is rare, luckily, uh, at 1.2 to 0.2, uh, about one cases per million uh, per year. Again, it's typically women uh, aged 60 years or older who have a previous history of hypothyroidism. It is more common in winter months, uh, and this creates a diagnostic problem uh, because patients, of course, may be hypothermic for other etiologies during winter months, but uh, epidemiological data suggests that it is more common in winter months. The mortality is high, and that, like I said, this is often because the diagnosis and management is delayed and may be as high as 60%. They usually, again, are precipitating factors, and usually this is uh, a, a, an infection, so a urinary tract infection or a pneumonia. Uh, many of these patients will be on central nerve and nervous system depressants, such as our patient was, or on narcotics. Uh, and then there are no, no other number of other stressors uh, that uh, have been implicated. So patients uh, who have uh, another factor and uh, undergo surgery or are exposed to cold uh, may well develop myxedema coma. So again, the clinical features will be widely varied. Uh, and this is very much a very pronounced form of slowing down of metabolism and slowing down of systems. But again, it will usually be the cardiovascular, neurological, and gastrointestinal symptoms that uh, predominate. So patients become bradycardic and may get a pericardial effusion and go into cardiogenic shock. Uh, they're often confused and lethargic, but uh, remember that they also may get seizures um, and the steroid relaxation phase of reflexes is, is an important clinical finding. Uh, because everything slows down, they're often hypoventilated and hypoxic, um, and they may present with uh, nausea and vomiting, constipation, uh, or ascites, as well as a number of other metabolic uh, and hematological uh, abnormalities that have been documented in these patients. The diagnostic scoring system for this is uh, less well known, but you will see that this is pretty similar to a diagnostic scoring system for uh, thyroid storm. And that is because it's, again, these systems, uh, the cardiovascular system, the gastrointestinal system, and the neurological system, uh, where there are predominant uh, features. Um, again, this is a, a disease of thermoregulatory dysfunction. And the more, uh, so essentially the lower the body temperature of the patient, the higher the score is. Uh, patients who are comatous uh, get a higher score. And like I said, coma doesn't always have to be uh, present. Uh, again, the, the lower the heart rate, the higher the score. And the more decompensated this uh, cardiac failure is, the higher the score it will be. And again, similar to the Bertrand of ski criteria, a precipitating event will give an additional score here. So if patients score 60 or higher, this is highly su suggestive of myxedema coma. And if it's less than 25, it's unlikely. Anywhere in between might be suggestive of myxedema coma. 
So what predicts uh, patients who are going to die? And again, uh, similar to, high, uh, to thyroid storm, the series here are relatively small. Uh, so this is a series from 2008 looking at 23 uh, patients of the majority, 87% of them were women, and the average age, as I've already said, was around 60 years. But so when you compared survivors with non-survivors, those patients who had stopped their levothyroxine were less likely to survive. And those patients who were on sedating drugs, uh, again, were less likely to survive. So lower the heart rate and the lower the, the blood pressure, again, were contributing factors. Those patients who presented with associated sepsis or hypothermia uh, that didn't respond, again, did worse. And then what the bottom here shows, so these are very specific uh, intensive care scoring systems uh, that they've used. And so uh, essentially, if the higher this uh, intensive, care, intensive care score of uh, how ill a patient is, uh, the less likely they were to survive. So how do we treat it? Uh, again, again, want to emphasize that this is this decompensated hypothyroidism um, and requires specific thyroid treatment, but also requires very specific measures. So in a patient who has an altered mental status, bradycardia, hypotension, hypothermia, hypoglycemia, think that this may be myxedema coma. Remember that the hypoglycemia may be very refractory, refractory to glucose replacement, and again, the hypotension may be very difficult to treat. You may get a history uh, from a relative that this patient may have had prior thyroid disease, or there may be some clues when you look at the patient that they had a thyroidectomy, scar, or a goiter. And then again, there are a number of uh, laboratory measurements, uh, most importantly, their thyroid hormone measurements, but also their uh, uh, other parameters may be significantly abnormal. It's important that you find and treat the etiology of decompensation. These patients often have had hypothyroidism for many years, um, and finding the etiology is really important. Um, it's important to provide hemodynamic and vascular support, uh, as well as stress those intravenous hydrocortisone and uh, make sure that the patient remains euglycemic. Providing thyroid hormone replacement is really important, uh, as well as uh, supportive care management. So the mortality still remains between 20 and 25%. And in this situation, really intravenous levothyroxine is the mainstay of treatment. Remember, if you give levothyroxine via an NG tube, the gut absorption may be uh, impaired, uh, and therefore giving it intravenously certainly in the initial stages is very important. We usually give this as a loading dose of intravenous T4, um, and then subsequently you can go to a daily administration, and once the patient gets better and you think that they're absorbing, uh, you can uh, make the levothyroxine via an oral route. Um, what the series show is that you give, if you give high dose T3 to these patients, this is actually associated with increased mortality. However, in some patients, the conversion from uh, T4 to T3 may be impaired. And what I have certainly have done in a number of patients is adding a little dose of T3 to their treatment. So what do the ATA guidelines tell us? Well, pretty much what I've told you already, but so levothyroxine loading dose between 200 and 400 micrograms and then usually intravenous replacement of their standard dose. It's important that you give them a stress dose of hydrocortisone. And again, this patient had a 200 milligram per 24 hour infusion of hydrocortisone. Um, you can consider giving a small dose of levothyroxine with this uh, and the supportive measures such as warming the patient who is hypothermic, correcting their electrolytes, collecting their glucose is really important. And then you need to be careful in patients, uh, especially elderly patients who have significant cardiovascular uh, disease and comorbidities, that you do not overload them with your supportive measures. So coming back to the clinical case vignette, um, I think what my previous slides have shown is that the most appropriate treatment for this patient would be to start intravenous T4. Um, I, uh, in this not in this patient, but in some other patients, I have sometimes added in a low dose of T3, but not the 60 uh, micrograms that I was suggesting here. And uh, I gave reasons why I don't think they should be given via NG tube, because I do not feel that the patient would uh, adequately absorb it. So myxedema coma is decompensated hypothyroidism and is really still associated with significant morbidity and mortality. It's important that this is not a diagnosis that's missed. 
And in patients with an altered mental state, hypothermia and refractory hypotension or hypoglycemia, this is something you should think about. The concentration level of 3T4 in this situation is, diagnosis of is a diagnostic of hypothyroidism, and it's really important to take the full clinical picture into account here. It's important that you provide both adrenal and thyroid su supplementation and that you consider the early use of vasopressors in these patients. And again, many of these patients will require a multidisciplinary team approach and an intensive care setting. Thank you very much.